Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's seminar on Marie Sklodowska Curie Action Postdoctoral Research Fellowship. First of all, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to Dr. Susanna Renzo Vasu, who is the regional coordinator of Euraxis Worldwide ASEAN, and Dr. Armando Lasabuda, Marie Sklodowska Curie Action Postdoctoral Fellow from Indonesia. And both will share with us information about this prestigious fellowship. The Marie Sklodowska Curie Postdoctoral Research Fellowship is funded by the European Union. It offers researchers the chance to work on a project of their choosing at a host institution of their choice anywhere in the world. It's a highly competitive fellowship and recipients are chosen based on their research experience, academic achievements and potential to make a significant impact in their fields. In this webinar, Dr. Susanna Renzo Vasu will provide an overview of the fellowship and its application process, including eligibility criteria, the important dates, and the application requirements. I'm also very pleased to welcome Dr. Armando Lasabuda, who will share his personal experiences and provide tips and advice on how to successfully apply for the fellowship. The Marie Sklodowska Curie Action is part of the Horizon Europe program, which is the EU's big funding program for research and innovation. Horizon Europe is a transnational research and innovation program with a budget allocation of almost 100 billion euros. It represents an increase compared to 30% of its predecessor program. Horizon Europe is a key instrument to see beyond the horizon towards a green, digital, healthy and resilient future of the European Union and the world. So why would you consider Europe as a research destination? Three reasons. First, although Europe accounts for just 6% of the world's population, we account for 17% of the world's expenditure on research and development. Second, no less than 32% of the world's high-impact scientific publications come from Europe. And third, European researchers are responsible for 32% of the world's patent applications. Today's webinar is a fantastic opportunity for researchers who have recently completed their PhDs and to advance their careers. Whether you are a recent PhD graduate or a researcher looking to take this next step in your career, this webinar will provide you with valuable insights into the Marie Sklodowska Curie Postdoctoral Research Fellowship and how it can help you achieve your goals. I wish you all lots of success for your future plans to pursue a postdoctoral research. And I thank you for joining us today and wish you a very informative and engaging session. Terima kasih banyak. We're talking today about the MSCA Postdoc Fellowships, but before we're looking at this particular scheme, I'd like to just say a few words about Euraxis, the project that I am uh, representing here in Southeast Asia. I think it is a wonderful um, toolkit for anyone who's interested in finding out more about what's happening in Europe, where the opportunities are, and how you can perhaps spend some time in Europe. Uh, I would warmly invite you to make use of this particular project. What makes it very interesting is that it is both an online tool and um, a project in the real world, so to say, and online it combines information on the opportunities for researchers like yourselves, not just in one country, but in fact, as you can see, in 43 European countries, including Norway, where Armando is currently, and also nine worldwide locations across the globe, including Southeast Asia, but also, as you can see here on the list, uh, Canada, the US, India, China, etc. So on this particular portal, you find, first of all, a lot of information that is relevant 
to anyone who is interested in spending some time in Europe as a researcher, including entry conditions, what type of insurance do you need, but also um, information that's related to your research, for example, the intellectual property rights that you need to keep in mind. And we have not just information, but as I said, this is not just a virtual project, but we have a network of currently over 650 service centers all across Europe with people who are there to guide you and support you in your research and mobility experience. Euraxis on the Euraxis portal also combines all the open opportunities for research career development. We have a jobs and funding database with thousands of opportunities on a daily basis, always between nine and 13,000, not just uh, fellowships for postdocs, but also PhD openings, of course, and uh, career opportunities with industry partners all across Europe and all across our global partner countries. We also offer a partnering tool. Again, I think this is very important for young researchers whose own network might not be as sophisticated just yet. This is really an opportunity for you to reach out uh, spread out your tentacles and build your own network of collaborators across the world. And this, and I'll come back to that later on, because this is very important for everyone who's listening today, we are offering a hosting database. Now in that database, you find concrete offers from not just European, but global uh, institutions that are looking to host fellows at their own institutions. For example, currently, of course, the MSCA postdoc fellowship call is open and you have, I just looked, just below 500 offers of institutions in Europe who are looking to host a fellow for this particular call. There's also career development tools on the portal. Uh, again, this is something that is always important. It doesn't matter how advanced you are. And we have a mentoring scheme for researchers uh, that perhaps are successful with their application for a grant to go to Europe. And then you have the opportunity to be paired with a senior researcher in Europe who will take you under his or her wings to um, help you find your feet. This is what the Euraxis portal looks like if you were to look at it um, right now. And you can see here at the top, of course, all these various tabs that I just introduced to you. And we are also here in Southeast Asia. I am based in Singapore and my colleague, Dr. Jenny Elmako is based in the Philippines. Here highlighted in yellow is our email address. Whenever you have a question or a suggestion, you can reach out to us. Now, we're talking today about the MSCA fellowships. What are they? They are part of a huge, big pro uh, program called Horizon Europe. This is in a nutshell, the European Union's key funding program for research and innovation. You can see it runs over the course of seven years. It has almost 100 billion euros attached to it. And importantly, it facilitates international collaboration, which means it is open to the world. This is the structure of this particular program. We have pillar one, pillar two, pillar three, and we're looking today at the MSCA postdoc fellowships, which are hidden here in the excellent science pillar of Horizon Europe. Excellent science means this is funding earmarked for career development. This is meant for researchers, early career researchers that are starting out and they need to, um, need to be equipped with skills so that they can be uh, progressing throughout their research career. And this is where you find the opportunities for individual applicants. So you as an individual can apply for this particular fellowship. This is what the MSCA looked like, just the key features. I'm sure you're all aware this is a very prestigious program because as I said, it's really meant to provide the applicants and the successful grantees with the very best conditions for training skills and career development. It is a program that um, guides researchers throughout their career. And you can see here, there is various actions under this, starting from PhD fellowships to 
postdoc fellowships. This is what we're looking at today, but there are also opportunities for staff exchanges. Now, as I said, today we are looking at the MSCA postdoc fellowships. These fellowships are awarded through annual calls for proposals, it's important to remember, and the call for 2023 is currently open. It closes on the 13th of September, which leaves you with about June, July, August, well, just about four months to prepare a strong application. If you are not ready this year, don't worry, the call will open again next year, around the same time, and then also in 2025 and 26, always around the same time. This is the timeline. If you're applying this year, you would find out by around February 2024 whether or not you have been successful. And then in June, you could already start the project, but the funder is uh, very flexible. You could, in fact, postpone the start of your fellowship by up to 12 months in case, for example, you have something that you need to finish first before you jump to your next career step. This is uh, the fellowship. And uh, what makes this very interesting is that it is a fellowship that really promotes two-way mobility. If you are joining us as someone today who is based in Indonesia or in Southeast Asia or anywhere outside of Europe, then you are looking at the European postdoc fellowships. And this is what I'll be focusing on today as well. So the European postdoc fellowships are for applicants that want to go to Europe. So you're based, for example, in Indonesia and you want to go to Europe. There's also the Global Postdoc Fellowship. And in fact, Dr. Amandu, who we'll be speaking to in a few minutes, he's an interesting case because he is a, uh, a permanent resident in Norway. So he is uh, applying for the fellowship as a Global Postdoc Fellow. It's just nuances, nothing for you to be confused. The eligibility criteria are identical. But just for you, you're looking at the European Postdoc Fellowship. Now, what is this? This is, as I said, it's a personal postdoc fellowship. You as an individual researcher are applying for it and it will support you for a period of mobility. And mobility is a, is a key word here. It means you must move. This is not a fellowship to stay in Indonesia or stay in ASEAN. You have to move to Europe. There's no age limit. Um, the funding is for between one and uh, two years. And also important, it's open to all nationalities. Even if you're joining us and you're not from Indonesia, from anywhere else, it's open to all nationalities. And also it's open to all domains of research and innovation. The principle that applies here is the so-called bottom-up principle, which means the funder is not allocating funding to uh, certain scientific disciplines, but it's entirely up to how good your proposal is, whether or not you are successful. So anyone from the social sciences, from the humanities, from uh, interdisciplinary fields of research, this is just uh, as much a proposal, sorry, a fellowship for you too. As I said, the eligibility criteria are the same, whether it's the European or the Global Fellowship, you must have a PhD at the deadline. This year, it is the 13th of September, so on that day, you must have your PhD. Now, importantly, you, if you successfully defended your PhD, you're also eligible because it might take some time for the university to prepare the paperwork. So as long as you've successfully defended your PhD, you are eligible. In the second column here, you must not have more than eight years of research experience. So after you've obtained your PhD, you must not have more than eight years of pure research experience. If you have done something else, you've just been teaching or you've done something entirely different or you've been on maternity leave, on paternity leave, you've had military training, all these uh, periods can be discounted. Um, but overall, the amount of time must not be more than eight years. And you can see here, I've highlighted this and you will receive 
the uh, slides after today's session, you can uh, use this self-assessment tool, which we have online, to calculate whether or not you are eligible. And thirdly, as I mentioned already, you must comply with the mobility rule, which means you can only do this particular fellowship in a country in Europe where you have not lived for more than a year in the past three years. So if you've just come back from Norway, for example, and you did your PhD there, you have to go somewhere else. But there are lots and lots and lots of countries to choose from. You can see them all here. On the right hand side are the 27 uh, countries that are members of the political entity, the European Union. And on the left hand side, we have those countries that are part of Horizon Europe. Uh, and in any of these countries, you can choose your host institution. And I just added here the UK because we received the good news that institutions in the UK can also host you as a Marie Curie postdoc fellow. Now I wanna get back to you quickly to um, explain a little bit about the relationship between you as the applicant and your host. Now host, as you come across this in the um, documentation all the time, the host basically is your supervisor in Europe. For example, someone at um, the University of Berlin in Germany, that is your host. What is important is that you as the applicant and your host, you have to develop the proposal together. You don't just write something and then send it off and they will allocate a, um, a supervisor to you. No, this is not how it works. You need to find your supervisor first, together develop a proposal and together you apply. This is important to remember because the funder, the funding body is looking at this relationship between you and your supervisor uh, because what they're looking for is that you each benefit from this relationship. You bring something to this relationship and also your supervisor learns something. So it's a, it's a win-win partnership. Again, I've showed you uh, where you can go with this particular fellowship and here just a very quick overview over um, the funding that successful applicants will be awarded. You can see it's a very generous funding scheme, um, which really allows you to focus uh, yourself entirely on your postdoc work. You get a mobility allowance and you also get a family allowance if you have dependents, um, a spouse, or perhaps children. So this is, I think, um, a very generous scheme. Uh, there is a so-called country correction coefficient. What does that mean? It means if you go to a country in Europe where the living standard is perhaps not so high, then this will be reduced. If you go to a country where the living standard is very high, or that it's expensive to live, then the, uh, the grant gets increased accordingly. Just a few words about submission and evaluation. So these are the three criteria that the funder is looking for. The first one is excellence, the second one impact, and the third one uh, quality and efficiency of the implementation. It's important that, um, here you go. So excellence, um, basically refers to the research that you're proposing. And again, I always want to say a few words because people tend to get a bit spooked when they hear excellence. They tend to feel that they might not be, um, that, that they, they tend to be too scared in a way to, to apply, but you should, not, um, you should not take yourself out of the race, so to say. So of course the funder is looking for a research project that is solid and that brings something new to the table. They're looking here, as you can see, how sound is your methodology? Is it clear? Is that what you're doing scientifically accurate? And they're also looking, I said it just a few slides ago, at the quality of the supervision, the training and the two-way transfer of knowledge. And that refers to that relationship between you and the host that you've chosen. Are you both learning something from each other? And is this fellowship going to take you to the next level in your career uh, advancement? Impact, of course, 
uh, refers to the expected outcome of your research. Again, the funder is looking for outcome that uh, you also communicate not just within the very narrow scientific discipline that you're working in, but also you uh, have developed a strategy to communicate the outcome of your research beyond to the wider population. Maybe you have a plan in mind to communicate to, to schools, to school children, or you have a podcast, or you're developing a, a website. So this is what the, the funder is uh, looking for. And of course, quality and efficiency, it's standard, it applies to all other um, funding uh, um, schemes as well. Will you be able to complete your research in the given time frame? All the uh, applications for EU funding, including for this fellowship, are done through the so-called funding and tenders portal. This is where the European Commission publishes all open calls. And this is also where you will um, submit your application together with your host institution. This is the only way um, to communicate with the funding board. How to get started? And I'm sure we'll hear a lot from Armando in just a few minutes. I just wanted to just quickly give you some ideas on what you should do. Of course, I think the key would be to check, am I eligible for this particular program? I've put down here a few links that you should all look at, uh, specifically at the bottom, the self-assessment tool to see, am I still within the, the same, uh, the, the, the time frame that I can apply for this? Secondly, of course, you need to have a research idea. No one can take that away from, from you. That's the work you need to do. You should, of course, consult your peers as much uh, as possible and ask for their advice. And then the third step is to find a European host. This might be the biggest hurdle for a lot of you. We do, and this is the good news, offer a lot of support. I already mentioned we have the hosting offers on the Euraxis portal. We have another uh, database, which is uh, maintained by our colleagues from the MSCA Net project. They also have a matchmaking platform. Again, all my slides are hyperlinked, so you can look at this uh, later on. And uh, this is an event that we are uh, putting on as Euraxis Worldwide. You can see here on the 5th and the 6th of June, we are putting on matchmaking sessions. Here on the 5th of June, you will meet representatives from these nine countries who will inform us about the hosting office that they have available. And here on the 6th of June, again, 11 countries that are providing us with information on the hosting offers in their countries. So wonderful opportunities. And then of course, the final step, you will have to prepare a proposal. Uh, again, there's a lot of support available. We have the MSE national contact points who are based all throughout Europe. And in fact, also some of them are here in Southeast Asia. My colleague Jenny is uh, an NCP for the MSCA in the Philippines. You can also reach out to her and they can give you some advice on the formalities of your proposal as your draft heat. Now, before I hand over to Armando, there's uh, something else that I'd like to remind you of. Now, we're talking now specifically about doing a postdoctoral fellowship in Europe in the framework of a particular call where you have to develop your own proposal. So a lot of emphasis is on you to create your dream proposal and apply for it. But we also have um, a so-called co-fund mechanism also funded under the MSCA. And there you will also find postdoctoral fellowship opportunities. The difference here is that these are um, specific research uh, positions. So you're not applying with your own dream idea and you, you're not finding your own host, but there is already a consortium of partners, a consortium, a group of European institutions. They are working on a specific research project and they have specific openings for a number of postdocs. So they'll be looking for people with a very specific profile. All of these opportunities are published on the Euraxis um, 
jobs and funding database. And for these opportunities, there is no annual deadline. These opportunities come up all throughout the year. So it's always a good advice to just look at the funding and tenders portal um, every so often. And I know that Armando was in the fantastic position to receive both a co-fund fellowship offer and the MSc postdoc fellowship offer. So, and he is going to tell us a little bit more about his own experience in just a second. Just here, there are, of course, lots of uh, information online which you can um, consult. Now, thank you so much. And I now hand over to Armando Lasabura, who is an Indonesian uh, fellow, and he is joining us today from Norway. Amando, please, if you if you would like to start just saying a few words about yourself, what your background is, um, and maybe a little bit about your career and how it's taking you to Norway. Thank you, Amando. Uh, included in my uh, slides, so I just share my my slides now. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, at least good morning from Norway. Um, thank you, Susanna, for the introduction. And thank you, your access ASEAN and EU Office for Indonesia for inviting me to this webinar. Um, first of all, I'm honored to have been awarded this uh, Marie Curie grant. Um, it's really a, a prestigious and high, a very highly competitive uh, grant. Um, and having said that, I'd like to thank my supervisors, my collaborators, and also friends and colleagues, and also family uh, for the support. Um, so this webinar is part of the three webinars that I agreed uh, to present. Uh, so the first one was in, in early May, in early April, that was organized by uh, University of Indonesia and ITB. And then the second one was in uh, early May, organized by Doctrine UK, PPA Norway, and PPI uh, Dunia. And today is the, the third one, uh, and uh, we are lucky to have Susanna. So I also told the previous participants in the previous webinars that if you have any questions related to the formalities and procedures, uh, later on you can ask uh, Susanna and uh, yeah for this for this kind of questions. And I also suggest that uh, the participants today also to check the recordings from the pr previous webinars because it's not enough to tell all the tips and tricks uh, within only a short time, five, 15 minutes presentation. Um, yes, a little bit of my background. Um, I did my undergrad in Indonesia, uh, in university at in ITB. And then I moved to University of Bergen uh, to did my master. And then I did my PhD in Trumsa up in the north. And then a couple of courses. Uh, at UNIS, it's a, it's a university on Svalbard. And then last year I was in Royal Hollow University of London as a visiting scholar for about a year and then back to Tromsø. And this summer or autumn, I'll be moving south to Sydney, Australia um, as a visiting researcher for two years and then move back to Norway uh, in Oslo where UIO will be my host for this Marie Curie uh, project. And Trumso, as you can see here, is located up north. Uh, it's actually across the Arctic Circle. So you see this line, this orange line, uh, and it's located really close to the Barents Sea. And, and this is the location of the Barents Sea, uh, where my, my research is located. And we're going to see a bit more detail on, on, my, on my project in the next slide. So the Marie Curie project that I will be working on is called Bravo, Barren Sea Evolutions. Uh, it's going to be run for three years. So the aim is to model uh, the paleogeography uh, of the Barren Sea 
in the past uh, 66 million years, and also to model the sediment transfer and transport uh, in that steady area. And the hypothesis here is, uh, is the Barren Sea was or was not a conduit for ocean circulation between the Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean during that uh, time period. So we're going to test this hypothesis. And uh, I know it's not uh, it's not very easy, but we have to we have to uh, to do to, to do this research uh, because uh, the impact is is to better a better paleogeographical input for climate reconstruction in the past and it also uh, beneficial for future climatic modeling. Um, it's going to be challenging uh, for sure. But uh, yeah, we just have to push uh, the, the limit uh, or the boundary of, of the of human knowledge. And, and it is quite typical for Marie Curie. They fund this uh, kind of uh, idea uh, where we have the high, high risk, high gain uh, kind of topics. So here is the roadmap of Bravo. Uh, I submitted my application in 2021 and it was rejected uh, the, in 2022. So I did about four months of full-time preparation. And luckily Bravo was uh, linked to my uh, for my current work. So I do uh, the proposal writing uh, also in connection to my current project. And then I did the second submission in 2022, um, and it was granted in uh, 2023. Uh, for the second submission, it was about seven months, uh, but it's sort of part-time uh, preparation of proposal writing. Um, so this uh, Marie Curie, it's I would call it's a it's a marathon. It's not a, it's not a sprinting game. So we talk about long-term uh, preparation uh, that you have to you have to deal with, uh, because I heard uh, some stories that people can can submit their proposal one or two three times or more, uh, but I also uh, heard that some people can just submit first time and then they get the the fellowship. So it's quite fair. Um, then the next question is. Why did I apply for the Marie Curie uh, postdoctoral fellowship grant? So the first thing is because I love to do the research on this uh, exciting topic. I've been investigating this uh, Barren Sea for seven, eight years since I did my PhD. So I'd love to continue in this direction. And one way to go is to apply for this Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship. And then the second uh, reason is because it's uh, prestigious, high risk, high gain, as, as I mentioned, and it's super competitive, regional scale research grant. Uh, this fellowship uh, will be good in your CV if you if you're gonna win one, uh, and it's and it's also sort of uh, a ticket, I would say, because when you have this grant, uh, it will give you a plus uh, when you apply for a uh, tenure track position later on at the universities, if you got to pursue this uh, academic direction. And then the third one is because I'm eager to travel and I learn, uh, I like to learn from other experts. And it's very often as an academic, uh, we have to travel, we have to move countries to learn from other professors, or from other uh, research groups or from different labs, and you know, uh, when we are in the in the different in the new research environments, and we we gotta have a fresh eyes to to see the the research problem, and it will spark new ideas, also new collaborations. You know how to approach the research ideas, uh, so it it will be good uh, uh, for your academic career, and and this Marie Curie will provide you with this uh, mobility opportunities. So uh, it's really, really uh, a good uh, program if you like to, to travel and, uh, and then move uh, abroad. And then uh, how to approach the application. So I have prepared uh, three key tips 
uh, from Bravo application. So the first one is uh, to start now. Yes, uh, it's better to start early because as I said, you can, it can take years to, to, uh, to prepare uh, the application and also to, to win uh, at some point this uh, fellowship. And um, because it's also develops uh, over time. So your proposal will, will get better and better uh, uh, because uh, when you have new ideas, uh, also when you have new feedback, so uh, and and hopefully you will win uh, the fellowship at some point. And then the second uh, tips is uh, is to read the application even more, because um, some people say that you have to spend more time in writing, but it's actually you have to read more your applications. Uh, so my my tips is to. To ask feedback from from people, from from your friends, from your family, from different background disciplines, and also educational level levels. In my case, I ask uh, feedback from from uh, from people from economic background, statistics, from engineering, from uh, all kind of backgrounds, because we they will have different eyes and opinions on on your applications. And, and it's really it's really good at the end. So uh, and also if I mean if you hand over to your your family, for instance, your grandma, if she can understand your proposal, then it must have been really really clear. Then it's really good uh, for your application, right? And then my third, uh, it's my third advice is get help from experts. Like Susanna mentioned, uh, ask the national contact points to get feedback to your applications. Uh, also maybe professionals or consultants or researchers who have won uh, similar grants of award or awards. Uh, because maybe you heard, uh, or you can, sometimes you see there are researchers there that constantly want uh, grants or awards. So they must know uh, something right they must know a recipe how to write a good proposals so i would say contact contact those researchers or maybe contact your uh, uh, potential supervisors that uh, potentially or maybe the, he or she won previous grants so uh, i think that's that's really uh, give a good addition to 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 your uh, application um and then, as, as Susanna mentioned as well earlier, uh, so I I won I won another Marie Curie, and it was Kofun uh, Kofan uh, scheme. Uh, so if you check your access uh, website, or maybe in Norway, there's a website called Job Norge. Uh, so you can find this uh, this uh, uh, type of application. So you can just essentially write a proposal uh, and they will follow kind of Marie Curie scheme uh, in evaluating the proposal. So also with the expert evaluator and so on. So I suggest you also to uh, check uh, this kind of applications uh, because it's, it's very high, uh, highly uncertain uh, and it's just to open up new opportunities uh, with this uh, more Marie Curie's application. And I think that's all from me. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take ones. Uh, and you can also contact me to my website or my social media. Uh, so I hand over to Susanna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amando. And uh, I think it is always incredibly inspiring to hear from the fellows themselves how they've approached uh, this particular application. And it's, uh, Armando has told me before we started the session, he also hopes that a lot more Indonesian-based researchers will apply for this scheme because it really, I think, opens you doors. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity for you to spread your wings and, and do the research that you're dreaming of and that you want to do.
So thank you so much, Amando, and thank you so much for um, agreeing to answer questions. We have uh, at least 15 minutes uh, left and we already are receiving questions. So if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. It's easier for me um, to see them. And we have uh, one question by anonymous uh, attendee who is asking um, again about the age restriction about the eligibility criteria. I just want to uh, remind everyone there is no age limit. The eligibility criteria are the following. First of all, you must have a PhD at the time of the deadline, which is the 13th of September 2023, if you're applying for this year's call. You also must not have more than eight years of research experience after you've obtained your PhD. Now, someone asked, I've already done two to three years of postdoc research. It doesn't matter. As long as you fulfill this eight year limit, you can apply for this particular fellowship. Let us see another question. Um, there's someone, it's Nico, who is asking uh, about, I think if I, Nico, if you allow me, he's asking more generally, I guess, what, uh, what type of research is funded? And I think his question is, does it have to be a research topic that is only relevant to Europe? No. Um, I said in the presentation, the funding body is looking at excellent research, you have to make a valuable contribution, of course, to your field. And I think the outcome of your research must be applicable, you know, maybe a, a bit wider than just a very localized, um, narrow research topic that you might have um, that you might have chosen. So even, for example, as in Nico's case, he's studying a specific um, situation in the Indonesia's new capital city, I am sure the research output can then be um, applicable to comparable situations in cities across the world. So I mean, my advice would be to, of course, uh, do something where the research output is relevant, not just to a very localized area, but it can be um, relevant elsewhere. But maybe Amando, that would be um, a question that you could perhaps help us help us with. Yes, um, I agree. When we talk about impact, uh, you have to be clear when writing your applications. Uh, in my opinion, it's better to have also a specific kind of impact, but at the same time, it's also you have kind of global impact uh, uh, where your proposal is going to be. Uh, yes, I think that's that's a key point. Thank you so much, Armando. We have a question from Satya Zen directly to you. How did you find and approach your prospective host and supervisor? And how did your proposal development process how did your proposal development, how did this process of developing the proposal with the supervisor, how did you approach this? What, how can you talk us through the different steps perhaps? Uh, yeah, so to be honest, I, I didn't know my uh, supervisors before. I never met him or the team. So I just contacted them directly. Uh, I said, it's just a kind of cold email. So I just said, uh, I have these research ideas. Uh, maybe we can discuss and uh, talk about this. And then I, I said I, about this uh, topics and apparently uh, I get positive feedback from them and they agreed to, to, to develop a proposal. And uh, so I really wrote this from, from scratch. It's, it's, it's the first time I, I'm the one who, who create the draft of the proposal. And then, as, as Susanna mentioned as well, this is a collaborative effort. So I sent to the, the um, uh, collaborators and the supervisors, and they they gave feedback to 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 the draft. So I think this is how you you guys also have to approach, starting from your uh, perspective, and then later on it will develop develop uh, even more uh, when you get feedback from your supervisors or collaborators. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amando. So in your case, um, you did a cold 
application. I think that's very interesting because often we hear that the fellow already was in touch with the supervisor. But I think that's um, that's really interesting. And maybe you could tell us a little bit how you drafted your email, because I think that's very important. How did you make sure that they actually responded to you? Yes. So I also mentioned this earlier in the in the previous uh, webinars. Uh, please, before you contacted your you know potential supervisors, make a good uh, uh, homework. You know, like you 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 compose a good email. You you prepare the ideas first. So so it's not um, you know because you will represent this country. You will re represent Indonesia at some point, right? So you have to also kind of well prepare before you throw this cold email, because when when they when they responded uh, and then they asked for feedback or follow up of your application, you you have kind of a broad idea what what we're gonna do. It's not like re it's not like a really blank uh, cold email. Hey, I would like I would like to do this research with with you, and then you don't have any follow up ideas. So uh, I also suggest. You guys before you because emails are everywhere you can find easily people emails uh just be, be prepared uh before you really uh, send this uh, cold emails yes i think this is a very good point you have to imagine that um as we've heard this is a very prestigious fellowship there are lots of people who are looking to find um, a supervisor so professors in Europe will be receiving a lot of emails. So you have to make sure that yours is the one that stands out. And it does stand out if, as we heard from Amando, you do your homework, you find out exactly what is this person doing? Why um, should this person consider working with me? So you need to know what they're doing and then you need to be able to communicate clearly what you're bringing to the table, why you think you are a good fit. Um, and that's very important. So one uh, mistake that a lot of people make, I think, is just copy paste. They send the same email to a variety of, of people and people notice. Um, people have a very little time. So they really want to see that you've, you've made the effort to understand their background and you can very clearly communicate what you're bringing to the table and how this is of benefit to them. But as I said, also during the presentation, there are lots of um, available databases. Again, look at the Euraxis portal. There are opportunities listed there around uh, 500. And do try and join us on the 5th and the 6th of June, where you will hear our presentations from, um, from I think, over 30 countries who will, uh, again, give you an opportunity to, to make direct contact with potential hosts. Now let's see, we have uh, more questions here. And there's a question again uh, for Mustafa, who's asking again about the timeline. Now he's uh, saying, I do finish my PhD, but only uh, in December. But why can I not apply this year if you know, you're only deciding by February who gets the fellowship or not? The rules are you must have the PhD by September, the um, evaluation already starts in November, and by February, roughly, there will be um, a result announcement of who has been successful and not. Unfortunately, there is no playing with the deadline. If you don't have the PhD by the deadline, you'll have to wait until uh, next year. But again, as I said, this call is going to be announced on an annual basis, so uh, you shouldn't worry about it. And uh, Mustafa was also asking uh, how much time he would have once he's been um, notified that he is successful, then you have up to 12 months to start the fellowship. So if you're here in February, you could theoretically by June already be packing your suitcases and moving up to, uh, to Norway or wherever you're going. But if you still have to finish something up at, at your own university, you can postpone it until June 2025 in this case before you start the fellowship so it's quite a flexible arrangement now um some other questions i think maybe amando in your um in your grant what do you think uh, how did you tackle the issue of excellence how do you think did you make sure that the evaluators saw this is really 
uh, a proposal that is striving for excellence. Yes, uh, it's very important point actually excellence because in proposal in the proposal it will give you the highest point fifty percent portion of the of the proposal uh, mark. So you have to really develop uh, this section in your proposal. So one one way is to find what is the key research gap in your field. If you work long time in your research area, you you kind of notice that okay, this is something that are that are missing in this uh, in this field. So you focus on that uh, research gap, and you you kind of develop your proposal around that uh, topic. Uh, and and you have to address this very, I would say, diplomatically, because when you address a research gap, you somehow will also comment on previous work or what is the state of the art of the of the current research and it's also one of the feedback from my first version of my proposal that i i kind of address this quite harshly you know uh and so you have to really smooth and careful when when crafting your proposal when you address this research gap um yes i think i think that's that's what the really important points and you have to differentiate your proposal with with uh, with normal paper, or, or because we are we are kind of trained to write a research paper, but with this research proposal, it's totally different logic. The expert evaluators will first want to see what is the what is the missing point here, what we have to improve in what in this state of the art uh, research. So that, that's what you really have to focus on in your on your proposal when you talk about excellence. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amandu. So it's very different. And uh, maybe also to um, give background at this point, the proposal itself is not particularly long. I believe it's only 10 pages. Am I correct, Amandu? Yes, sure. It's only 10 pages. It's not that long. At the beginning, it's maybe it sounds really long proposal, but it's when you work in, in your application, it's really, really short because you have lots of ideas and then you have really condensed them, compacted them into only 10 pages. Thank you. So you need to be able to be very clear about what it is that you're trying to address, yeah. how you're going to do it and, and uh, why you're doing it. And I believe um, what uh, I've always hear from the from the evaluators is if you you should uh, look at the documentation. Yeah, there is um, a handbook. There's a there is the the call, of course. And uh, what the the advice that um, I think a previous fellow was saying is that she in this case put um, the call on one hand side of the screen, and on the right hand side she had her proposal. So she just made sure that she made reference to all the highlighted elements that are in the call text, just to make sure she doesn't miss out on anything. And I think once you do that, you're really on a on a safe track. Now, Amanda, maybe just a few practical questions that people are always worried about. Do you have to draft a budget? uh Budget, yes, but it's not in the main proposal because you have different section you have part a part b1 b2 if i correct uh and then one of the part uh you have to write this uh, budget but it's not super detailed uh you just have to write the uh, an amount of uh, months that you will be doing in your project and which countries that will you uh, go in your in your uh, fellowship because they will uh you have they, they have different calculation because of the coefficient numbers and so on and so forth so don't don't I, i'm not worried about that at all thank you amando and actually that's the question that just comes in from Moore Buziani, who is asking about the format of the proposal maybe you can just say a few words about the part a and the part b uh yes i think it's it's just better to to look at the website directly because it's quite form, formal and it's quite uh, procedural and you have to follow this really uh, carefully uh, i've got suggestion that uh, it's really sad if you have a good proposal and you just fail because of you miss one uh, section in your application and 
if you we before you, we, that's why before you submit your uh, application it's better to have uh, you know this national contact points or maybe you got a local support from universities that can go through this application uh, and make sure that you don't miss any any uh, you know details of these formalities thank you so much but uh, yeah. maybe to to ease Noah's uh, mind it is a standardized application there's a part a and a part b and part a basically relates to your the formalities who's your supervisor uh which institution is it there is also as a segment in there about the budget but as armando said he it's not difficult to fill in and you of course uh, you get support from your supervisor and of course the institution in europe they have uh, a research support office that is very well trained in in doing all these administrative um, procedures and then the part b is the actual proposal this is where you write your research idea and how you're going to do it but overall as amando said you should not um, worry too much about it there's a question that i think amando i'd like to um get your assessment on this and then i'll also say a few words about it. it's an anonymous attendee who's asking do we need to get a supervisor who is a very high profile researcher for example a nobel Prize laureate or not? What is your advice? Maybe Amando, I don't know. Is your supervisor a Nobel Prize winner? <laughs> no, no, no. It doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize. You know, he, what I heard is just he or she has to be the expert or the right person to to work on this project. It doesn't matter is if he or she has the uh, you know professor level because I heard some people. They, they get this fellowship with associate professor uh, rank because at the end they will see uh, if 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 the uh, if the if the supervisors has the capabilities of of uh, work on this and this project as well also with with you as a as a fellow uh, but I heard also that uh, you know previous previous Nobel winners, you know they they kind of work with the previous winners so it's better to find you know this uh, kind of professors or supervisors that that previously won uh, or uh, this kind of grants because they know how to develop a good proposals uh, but if not that i mean yeah science is science if you write a good science then it sounds logic then why not just go for it Yes, thank you so much, Amanda. And I, that's absolutely correct. It doesn't have to be a very high profile person. But as we said, that uh, both Amanda and I have been emphasizing it, what the funder is looking for is how good a fit the applicant and the supervisor are, because both of them need to bring something to the table. And uh, if you think about it, someone who is incredibly uh, famous will be a very busy person and then the question is whether they have time to actually take care of a postdoc fellow so um really when you're when you're looking for that person you should really start a uh, look at uh, the publications in your field maybe someone you've come across at a conference you also should look at um the infrastructure at um that institution do they have the lab equipment that you need to carry out your postdoc uh and then of course can they also offer you besides just the research supervision do they have career development training that you would like to benefit from etc so this is uh, a lot more important than just being somewhere in a particular ranking um amando one specific question uh, for you so we're running out of time but i want to ask the, these two questions this comes from kanita juniati and she's asking how did you handle the contingency plan section and the open access section in the application. Yes, for the contingency plan. Uh, yes, that's true. In in uh, in your application, you have to address you have to address this uh, also in in uh, in a clear way. What happen if one of the the idea or one of the approach. Uh, one work so you have to have the a clear uh strategy how to approach this uh yeah and then it has to be well written as well in your application uh with the open access of course nowadays uh, i mean funding from the eu also from norway and i i'm sure with the other european countries they will force the open access 
uh, even more to 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 disseminate it, uh, your result into into broader audience, and and then just write uh, in your application that you're gonna you gonna publish this all in open access, uh, yeah. And when it, when we talk about Marie Curie, it's, it's really tight uh, competition. So don't just focus on the excellence part, which will give you a 50% uh, uh, weight, but it's also you have to focus in the small details in the in the implementation. It's only 20%, but at the end, it, it may be the one that, that uplift your application and make it a big difference with the other applications. So just focus on every small details in your applications, not, not uh, too much focus on, on one specific uh, uh, yeah, section. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think with this, we've basically already come to the end of our webinar. I just put in the chat box here a link to uh, a webinar recording, which we held on Friday. It was with Dr. Anirabish of the UK Research Office. And the recording is already up on our YouTube channel. And if you are specifically interested in finding out the situation with the UK, because I know that Budi Valuyo was asking a question online about um, the funding that uh, recipients receive that choose a UK-based uh, host institution. Dr. Ann was referring to this in her session, so I have posted it here. You can look at um, the recording. Now, I think I'd like to give you the last word, Amando, maybe if you have a, a message for everybody who is listening in today, watching us, what would be your advice if they're considering, and maybe a little bit hesitant still, whether or not they should throw their hat in the ring? What's your advice? Yes, my advice to the, my Indonesian fellows that uh, just be brief, just write your applications. Don't think too much. Uh, just start now. Develop your ideas uh, and contact potential supervisors and read carefully all the guidelines and uh, and uh, documents of the Marie Curie. And I think uh, it will be good in the end. Yeah. Absolutely. If you don't try, you never know. And uh, again, just like Amanda said, don't be too shy. Give it a try. And I do hope to see a lot more Indonesian grantees uh, next February who will be, you know, shouting hooray in their living rooms. I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, we will publish the recording on our YouTube channel tonight. It'll be up tomorrow morning, but I will, of course, um, send everybody an email. Amando, you have received a question whether or not you want to share your email address. I leave that up to you if you want to share it in the chat box. But we will, of course, share Amando's slides also on the Euraxis website later on, and then you can perhaps reach out to him. And in the recording, we will, of course, have the opening address by Ambassador Vincent Piquet, uh, Ambassador of the EU to Indonesia. I apologize for the technical glitch earlier today. And with this, thank you so much, everyone. And fingers crossed. See you all very soon. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Susanna. Goodbye. Bye-bye.